Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. With Jamie Ward, University of Sussex, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. Hi, in this edition of Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size, I'm going to go through really exciting developments in mapping the human connectome. So what is a connectome? We can think of a connectome as being a wiring diagram of the human brain. Now, wiring diagrams of the brain have been around a long time in neuroscience, but using MRI methods to address this approach is something that is very cutting edge and has only really happened in the last decade or so. But to illustrate the scale of this challenge, the human brain has 86 billion neurons, and each neuron can have a thousand synapses on it. This is more stars than there are in the galaxy, and more base pairs than there are in the genome. To count all the synapses in the human brain would take three million years, counting at the rate of one per second. So really, how is this even possible? Well, the way we can think about this is that the connectome can operate at different scales. So you can measure the connectome at the, the scale of synapses, and this has already been mapped in uh, other species, such as the, uh, the worm C. elegans. We can also map it at the level of individual neurons. And again, there are models that do this in mice, in the visual cortex and the retina. In humans, we're really operating at a different scale, at the scale, for instance, of centimetres, um, in which we can map different kind of networks or large scale uh, patterns of connectivity within the brain. And the reason why we're interested in this is that although we can say that the brain is made up of different regions, each of which has their own particular uh, specialization in terms of information processing, somehow we know that all of these regions are communicating with each other and actually any complex task is probably not going to reside in one region, it's going to be a coordination of multiple different regions. So mapping the human connectome with MRI uh, can involve a number of things and broadly there's a division between structural uh, mapping and functional connectivity. And now there are also attempts that bridge structural and functional together, or multimodal connectomes, if you will. So the structural connectome, uh, the sequence that's been mainly used in MRI is one that's called DTI, or diffusion tensor imaging, which is a particular MR sequence that is sensitive to the movement of water molecules in the brain. The idea behind it is that water molecules are largely trapped within neurons because uh, of the fatty membrane that surrounds the neuron itself. Water isn't free to move in and out, but it is free to move within the neuron, and neurons tend to be long and thin because of the axons that, uh, that stretch out uh, from the neurons. So water can move along the length of the axon, but not in and out of the axon very easily. So using a particular MR measure called fractional anisotropy, we can measure the diffusion of water molecules in each and every brain region. And we can give it a value between zero and one, where one means that water is a highly, water diffuses in a highly organized direction, so a one-way uh, flow, for instance. And a value of zero means no organisation. That doesn't mean no white matter. It might just mean that the white matter is unstructured. It goes at every particular uh, angle uh, through the, the brain. Using these DTI sequences, we can produce beautiful and detailed uh, maps of the white matter connectivity in the brain. Although these appear to be very detailed, actually we're still only measuring the main highways of the brain. All the A roads and the B roads, the, the minor uh, uh, pathways and axonal connections are not, still not visible using this method. So we're still only uh, seeing the tip of the iceberg in what we're measuring here. So the structural connectome is really to do with the long-term structure of the brain that will differ from one person uh, to the next. Of course, it will change over time as a person ages, but it does not change moment to moment in the way that uh, functional uh, connectivity might. The functional connectome, on the other hand, 
uses the regular bold response that we use in other kinds of fMRI analyses. So remember that the bold response is changes in blood oxygen that occur as a result of neural activity. Whereas in regular fMRI analyses, we ask questions such as, does the activity in region 1 change as a result of a particular task, such as viewing faces? And does activity in region 2 change as a result of viewing faces? When we do a functional connectivity analysis, we ask other kinds of questions. We ask, is the activity in region 1 and region 2 correlated when we look at uh, faces, for instance? So we're asking the question, do these particular regions tend to talk to each other, show the same kind of response profile when we're engaged in a task? And if they do tend to show the same kind of response profile, we say that they're functionally connected or in a network. One particular way in which this is used is in resting state paradigms. So rather than giving a person a task, they're just asked to lie in the scanner and not really do anything. It's not clear what rest means in cognitive terms. The person will still be doing something, uh, thinking about um, thoughts, what they're going to do next, and so on. But essentially what this means in terms of mapping uh, the functional connector is that we can take spontaneous uh, changes or fluctuations in brain activity in particular regions, and we can see how they correlate with all the other regions of the brain to try and construct what are the particular networks of the brain. So the way that we do this is that we divide the brain into lots of regions, so the voxels that we have in conventional fMRI analyses, and we construct a very large matrix of correlations between these regions. So in our rows, we have all our brain regions from 1 to 100,000, or how many voxels we have. And in our columns, we also have the brain regions from 1 to 100,000. We can then ask the question, um, does activity in brain region 1 correlate with activity in brain region 2? Does it correlate with activity in brain region 3? Does it show no correlation with activity in brain region 4? And maybe it shows a negative correlation in brain region 5. So a negative correlation in this case means that one, when one brain region is switched on, another brain region tends to be switched off. So they are not uh, coupled together, at least in this particular scenario. So, in effect, our fun functional connectome, in this case, looks like a matrix of numbers, a very large matrix of numbers, just saying uh, how the activity in regions tends to go up and down when the activity in other brain regions goes up and down. That's all it is. But what we find is that although this is a very, very large matrix, there is a small and finite number of networks within this very large matrix, maybe 10 or a dozen networks that have been given particular names. And what this means is that all those group of voxels tend to correlate together with each other and with other perhaps distant brain regions in the, uh, in the brain. So for instance, one of these networks is called the default mode network. This tends to be activated when the person is at rest more than at task. Whereas other networks, such as the salience network, is involved in uh, orienting attention to things that are interesting or worthy of attention within the uh, environment. So each of these networks might have different functional properties. And the way that these networks flip from one state to another, uh, the way that they transition, for instance, or the, the way that they are uh, structured might differ from one person to the next, in a way that might be interesting. It might be a marker of intelligence, for instance. And they might also differ from one group to another. So patients with Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia might differ in the way that brain regions talk to each other that isn't sh shown in conventional fMRI analyses. Uh, so it's about the way that, uh, that brain regions are coupled and form networks might be a distinguishing feature of particular neurological or psychiatric conditions. <music>
they're combining information from structural uh, connectomes, so differences in white matter maps, for instance, as well as functional connectomes, so this particular functional connectivity matrix to construct what's called a parcellated map of the human brain. For instance, that would contain 180 regions in each cortex, where the size and shape of each region might act as like a fingerprint for each person. Everybody might differ in terms of the size of each of these regions. But what determines the boundaries of these regions is what goes in and out, the kind of information flow in terms of uh, how this region is coupled with other brain regions, and also what the white matter profile looks like. So these are particular uh, maps of individual human brains that are, are constrained by uh, connectomics, if you will. People have also wondered, well, if the brain is a massive network in which all regions talk to each other, does this mean that we can't really talk about individual brain regions as having any particular speciality or any particular uh, function? I think whilst it's true to say that any particular cognitive activity is going to involve multiple brain regions rather than one, it isn't necessarily the case that all of our cognitive activity is distributed throughout all of the brain at any particular point in time. And this kind of analysis comes about by looking at um, how things are connected or the degree to which things are connected. So if we think of the structural connectome, we can calculate estimates like, well, if every brain region was structurally connected to every other brain region with white matter, how big would our head be? And some people have calculated that our head would need to be as big as Manhattan Island in terms of the uh, diameter if every single uh, point in the brain connected to every other point in the brain with white matter. So this suggests that actually our, our brain is not connected to every other uh, region within the brain, that actually the connections are somewhat sparser uh, than this. I mean, it might still be the case that every region is still only five or six synapses away from every other, but in terms of direct connectivity, it tends to be sparser. And some people have argued that the brain has what is called small world properties. A small world property means that um, the regions tend to communicate only with a small number of other regions that tend to be the ones that are nearby and long-range connectivity tends to be the exception rather than the norm in the human brain. And this has come about from modelling of uh, the human connectome both structurally and functionally. And what this means in effect, that brain regions are still likely to have some degree of specialisation simply because they have rather limited inputs and outputs. Any given brain region does not talk directly to all the other regions of the brain. And this means that it will develop some degree uh, of speciality. So whilst we can think of the brain as being an integrated whole, this does not necessarily negate the view that individual brain regions will be, uh, have some preferential processing of some kinds of information over and above others.